Hi everyone, uh, Stepan here. In this video I'm going to talk about creating plans during a middle game and I'm going to try uh, and explain and emphasize uh, the importance of always being aware of a plan that you're following and not simply making moves at random and just uh, placing your pieces around the board and, or trying to find cheap tactics or easy solutions to the position. Now, uh, there's a difference between strategy and tactics. Tactics involve uh, momentary uh, situations on the board which allow for a certain thing to happen. For example, your opponent just undefended a piece and you can create a tactical possibility and win that piece or something else. Strategy, on the other hand, uh, usually revolves around long-term uh, thinking, long-term plans and uh, uh, around static advantages. So. While a tactical opportunity may be created uh, with a single, a single move, a strategical plan will often be static in nature and you can often plan in advance. Now, the biggest uh, difference between strong and weak chess players is that the strong ones almost never uh, simply make moves. They often move them with a plan in mind. And often when, when a strong player makes a move, it has been conceived, the thought of the move has been conceived 10, 5 or 10 moves ago, not uh, the exact position, but what he wants to do with the piece, what he wants to do with whatever, however he wants the position to change in his favor. So a strategical plan would be uh, what you can do to change the position in your favor. And there are numerous types of, uh, of strategical plans and they involve uh, different uh, uh, different ends or different uh, things that you want to achieve and I'm not going to mention them all I have written down several on the on the right side of the screen so you can see some examples and we are go going to go over them but the, assess the essential thing is that you are able to assess the position find the thing that you want to achieve in the position and play accordingly and uh, so that it doesn't happen that on each move you think, hmm, what do I do now? Is this piece good here or whatever? You need to have a, a, a plan in mind and it's often best uh, to have a bad plan than to have no plan at all and uh, believe me when you play aimlessly you often either waste time or blunder so having a plan in mind will help you uh, will help you think more clearly play faster and play better now one of the best ways uh, to become better at creating middle game plans is by analogy so one of the best ways to improve at middle games is to have a knowledge base in your mind uh, which is simply a pattern recognition method uh, in which with which you will be able to uh, think of a plan faster during the game because you saw it before so the best training method i would recommend would be to analyze as many games and try to analyze them with having the plan in mind so try to uh, get into the players heads and uh, try to come up with an idea what they were thinking about. Why did he make this move? What does he have in mind? Uh, what is his plan? He he did this because he wants to do this, this, this and this. So uh, if you want to do something, uh, you create a plan. So you will, you will often be able to reconstruct the player's plans from their moves. And uh, I would recommend training that way. And uh, soon enough, you are going to have a knowledge base of strategical plans in your head, in your head which are going to come up uh, almost subconsciously during the game and you are often going to think oh he did this I could do that and often uh, some things are going to become clearer during the game because you remember the plan somebody uh, did in in a game that you analyzed two years ago so that would be a great training method and lastly uh, there are two types of plans and uh, one thing I would like to emphasize is that uh, that is something that I often have, have problems with. If the position is inactive, if it's not clear what I should do, if it's not clear that I can win something, attack something, do whatever, uh, then I often play aimlessly. Now, the best advice I can give you is that if you can't find a good plan of your own, don't waste time, prevent one of your opponent's plans. Those are called negative plans. So positive planning is when you plan to do something. Negative planning is, you, is when you plan to prevent your opponent from doing something he has planned. So very often in a position you are going to have a great plan of your own available and you are going to think of a plan for your pieces and for your position. And if not, there's certainly a plan for your opponents. So uh, if you can't find, find a clear plan, it's probable that the position is either really boring and really equal, in which case, well, 
you could draw and you can't do anything about it or your position is worse and your opponent is marching towards a plan, plan of his own which is going to make your position worse. So remember that it's better to have a bad plan than no plan at all and you have to think of plans before you make aimless moves. So uh, think of plans and play towards them. Even though your plan might change, it's better to follow it until you decide to change it, to change it definitely. Now, uh, I've tried to use uh, one single position for showing you uh, all of uh, for showing all the plans uh, written on on the screen because I think it's imp it's important to be able to create a plan in any position possible. I have only uh, used this position to to show you the the plan with the pawn majority because uh, there's no pawn majority here. Uh, so I think it's very important to be able to assess any position and to come up with a plan in any position because and that's that's another thing that I found out talking to stronger players they they often spend more time planning than analyzing and calculating and uh, when when you look at the grandmaster's play I always imagined them having like a to a5 he's going to take I take 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 sort of like Nakamura talks during during his streaming but it's never really like that they often think of plans uh, more often than than they calculate than more often than than they use raw calculation so okay the first thing here let's say you have some uh, knowledge base some strategical plans you have in your head you remember them let's say those are the examples written on the board so now your plan is uh, to improve a single piece on the board okay blacks to play let's flip the board Okay, uh, white just played knight to d2, knight b to d2, and this is a typical uh, Italian position, this is the classical variation of the gioco piano, and I, uh, I hope you know some general plans in the position, if you don't, I have made a video on the, on the gioco piano, you can check that out. So what does black want to do? Which pieces are bad? Uh, which piece would I like to improve? Okay, this rook is definitely bad. This bishop is sort of okay. This bishop is sort of misplaced and white can probably play d4 and chase it away. This knight isn't really doing anything. It's only preventing white's d4 break, but that isn't such uh, such a big deal. So let's find the plan. Uh, if you know the common plans in the Italian for both sides, then you know that one plan is transferring your knight uh, from e7 to g6 and then controlling the f4 square. So that might be one plan. Another plan is uh, how do I improve this piece? How do I improve this piece? You get to improve them both by developing your bishop. So let's say bishop to d7. This piece develops, uh, this move develops a piece, improves your bishop, it's now controlling. Uh, two diagonals and it definitely makes sense. Retreating to the bishop to a7 is actually the most common move here. Uh, retreating in anticipation of d4, so that definitely improves the bishop as well. So those would be some plans for black. Let's say black plays bishop a7, which is the most common move. Now let's think of a, uh, a plan uh, to improve uh, one single piece for white. Uh, once again, if you are unfamiliar with the common plans in the Joko Piano, I'm sorry, I'm going to just uh, fast forward. Uh, and uh, you can watch the video if you want. Uh, one common plan for this knight, which just went from b2 to d2, is to get into the f5 square or to control d5 and f5 from e3. So one plan might be uh, to get your knight to f1 and then to g3 or to e3. So this is a very good way to improve a piece. This knight on d2 uh, isn't really doing anything. So a plan for white, which uh, will take about four moves, might be rook e1, knight to f1, knight to g3, knight to f5 so four moves and that's a plan that's a clear plan and if you have that plan in mind and here you play rook to e1 then once your opponent plays let's say knight to e7 you don't really have to spend any time you know that this knight wants to get to g3 and then to f5 so you might just play knight to f1 momentarily without wasting any time so this would be a way to to think of how to improve a single piece Okay, so this Italian position is very rich, so here the plans uh, are easy to find. It will be much harder when you get out of theory, when you don't have the pattern recognition, uh, the advantage of pattern recognition, because what theory is, it's pattern recognition, and you memorize the theory, you know where, where the pieces go. But once you get into unknown territory, once you get into a middle game that you don't know, it's much harder to, to, to decide where to move a piece, to plan where to put a piece, because you've never seen that position before. So I would suggest uh, analyzing positions, middle game positions, in the openings that you usually play. So I, uh, for example, play the Italian, 
So I would advance this position, let's say, 10 or 15 moves in advance, and then I would try to find the same plan there. So how do I improve a single piece uh, 10 or 15 moves further? So those plans of improving a single piece can be applied to any stage of the game. Uh, the second thing, the second example, which might be a great plan, and this is now uh, a position which is actually possible to, to, to come out of a real game. Imagine a few more pieces being on the board, it's, it doesn't matter. A common thing in end games and in middle games, which you need to think of, is that whichever side has a pawn majority on the queen side, when, the, when both kings are castle king side, is much more likely to create a passed pawn for a simple reason that the kings are closer uh, and uh, they can usually defend the king side pawn majorities. So why it's common plan here and uh, a plan in the head of any chess player would be, okay, let's create a passed pawn. So my plan is b4, a4, uh, c4 b5 just liquidate one of the pawns create a passed pawn and that's it so this might be a plan and it's important to think of a plan like this during the during the middle game and there are numerous openings which from move 10 or 15 already have positions where white or black has a position has a position with a majority on the queen side so this is a very important plan to have in your uh, strategical plan knowledge base in your head this could win a lot of games and if you have this structure with let's say rooks being on on f1 and on a1 on a8 and on f8 let's say the knight is on f3 a knight is on f6 uh, a knight is on d7 uh, put the bishop here and put some bishops i don't know here and here whatever imagine the board being full of pieces it's still important that you think of your pawn majority on the queen side remember that you have it just try to uh, try to imagine the board without any pieces on and in this position you will know that any end game is favorable for you so your plan might be okay let's create a passed pawn on the queen side it might seem far far-fetched on move 20 with 10 with 10 pieces on the board but it's the correct way to think and to play during a middle game you need to have your advantages in mind when creating plans Okay, uh, another advantage, an attack on the king, and this is one more really clear uh, example, knight b to d2 for white, let's get back to the starting position. Uh, already here, and I've played this position uh, many times, uh, I start planning an attack. An Italian is a great example of a position in which white can get really active and have a faster attack. One tempo at least faster. So my plan is, once again, we are starting from this position. This is now move 8 in the one of the most theoretical openings out there and almost every player in the world knows this position, but you still try to create an attacking plan. You need to have your plan in mind as early as in the opening, but I'm once again using this position as an example because it's known and it's much easier to, to find plans here and it's very rich. So let's get back to our previous plan. We want to improve our piece. Knight f1, knight g3. Now from this position on, uh, let's say bishop a7, uh, let's say rook to e1, let's say knight to e7, knight to f1, knight to g6, knight to g3. Let's say we got here. And now let's find an attacking plan. What's my attacking plan? My knight is a monster on f5, that's one thing. My bishop is much better than uh, my opponent's bishop, so the f7 square is weak. My queen is able to come to h5 in some positions. Where does my bishop want to go? If you want to find uh, an attacking plan, then you need to think of a way to bring all of your pieces closer to your opponent's king. So if I try to find an attacking plan here, I would try to find a way to improve my dark, square, dark squared bishop. How do I do that? Perhaps I want to go to g5, exchange this strong defender. Perhaps I want to get rid of this bishop. So I can so that I can jump into into f5. So those two things might be in my plan. Another thing I might consider is h4, h5, dislodging the g6 knight. And let's say another thing is uh, that I play knight to h5 in some positions and uh, trade trade the f6 knight and get my queen to h5. So this is an attacking plan. Now, if I start playing this position uh, with that thought in mind, let's say your opponent plays bishop to e6. Now, you have your attacking plan in mind. What do you do? Uh, you want to improve your bishop, get an attacking position, perhaps push h4, h5. You want to centralize your queen or bring it to the queen side. And you want to, let's say, get your a1 rook active. You need to play your next move with all of those things in mind. You have an attacking plan. You're not playing purposeless chess. You have an attacking plan. So let's say your, oppo your opponent played bishop e6. How does that influence your attacking plan? This, this bishop is one of your strongest attacking pieces, so... 
You don't really want to exchange it. Perhaps allowing your opponent to take and taking with the queen would benefit your plan because then you would be attacking the b7 square and still put pressure on the f7 square. So let's say after a move knight to g5, this rook can't really move easily. So if I was if I were following my attacking plan from this position, after bishop to e6, I would probably play a move such as knight to g5 and not be worried about my opponent taking here because if my opponent takes on b3 then my knight, my knight can jump into f5 and if my opponent's tr opponent tries to chase away my my bishop from g5 with h6 then knight to a5 uh, then knight to f5 is even stronger so i would be happy here with this position and perhaps i would play bishop to g5 so this is i'm not saying it's a good move just that I've played it considering my attacking plan, which is often more important than playing the best move. Okay, uh, the second uh, thing, uh, another example I wanted to talk about is exchanging inactive pieces. Let's flip the board once again. In this position, uh, black to play. Uh, you want to create a plan of uh, exchanging one of your inactive pieces for one of your opponent's active pieces. We just saw that already. Uh, black here might play bishop to e6 immediately if he wants to follow that plan through. Uh, in this position, the bishop on b3 is definitely more active than the bishop on c8. So uh, if you want to find a plan which will involve uh, exchanging an inactive piece for your opponent's active piece, which makes perfect sense, this is one of the most common plans in, in the middle game, then this would be a clear example. This bishop is worse than this bishop. So exchange it. Bishop e6, there's no way for white to decline an exchange uh, if he puts his bishop to c2, then your bishop is now more active than his, and you have achieved what you wanted. So uh, this is a very common plan, and you need to think of this plan uh, in every game you play several times. Which of your pieces are bad, which of your uh, opponent's corresponding pieces are better, and play accordingly. My bishop is worse than my opponent's, exchange it. So that's it. If your queen is better than your opponent's, you don't want to exchange it, etc. So... Once again, if you can't find uh, your inactive piece, which is worse than your opponent's active piece and the way to exchange it, try to think of the negative plan. Which piece would my opponent like to exchange? So if I were white here uh, on the previous move before knight to d2, I would think, which piece does black want to exchange? And I would think of this bishop. Okay, so that's, so that's one example. Uh, the next thing, let's go back to the, to the starting position. Gaining control of a particular particular square uh, in the Italian d4 is the central square of the game, and usually the whole position will, re will revolve around d4. Whether white can push through with d4, what are the consequences of that, etc. So uh, this was uh, what white had in mind with the move c3, and very often in the Italian uh, you you want to keep control of d4 or push through with d4. So in this position, if I had that plan in mind. I would think of way, if I wanted to uh, keep control of one square, this would either be uh, d4 or f5. So uh, to control the f5 square might be one of the essential aspects of the Gioco Piano. So once again, my plan is we are following some of the previous plans as well. But if you can combine several good plans, then that's the best thing. So rook f1, rook e1, knight f1, knight g3, controlling f5. Now the second thing I want to do to increase the control of the f5 square is either to exchange a defender, which would in this case in this case be the c8 bishop, or put more or put my more pieces to control the f5 square. So one idea might be knight f1, knight g3, controlling f5, and the second one might be to transfer my other knight uh, to d2, to c4, to e3, and then to control f5. And this has actually happened in games, so in maneuvering positions where you have time to do that, it's it's a great idea. So this would be a way uh, in which you could gain control of a particular square. Now if I do get my knight into f5, my opponent can just take. But if I then transfer my other knight to d2, to c4, to e3, and to, and to control f5, then I'm controlling it twice. This is just an example. I'm not saying that you should play this in, a, in an actual game. Just trying to find a plan for each example out of the same position, because I believe it's possible. Uh, putting pressure on your opponent's pieces. Okay, it's it's fairly easy to do in this position. Once again, uh, knight f1, knight g3, bishop to g5, putting pressure on the knight. Uh, another thing that you might want to do after your knight is on g3. Okay, let's play some random moves. 
uh, knight here, rook here, knight e7, knight to f1, let's say c6, I'm just playing random moves for black, knight to g3, uh, let's say bishop to d7, bishop to g5, let's say black plays stupidly, and then you play this. So this would be a plan to put pressure on the f6 knight. This is, uh, in, in, a, in a game, this can't really happen, so this is the ideal case scenario, but you need to have that in mind, because if you want to put pressure on the f6 knight, and you have a good reason to put pressure on the f6 knight, then you need to find the ideal way to do it. That will enable you to think of ways that your opponent can prevent that. So your plan is knight, uh, rook e1, knight f1, knight g3, uh, and then knight to h5, putting pressure on the f6 knight, in conjunction with bishop to g5. Now, once you think of this plan, you're going to come up with ideas. Okay, what if my opponent plays h6? What if my opponent plays knight to e7, which is a common plan, then I might capture the knight immediately with my g5 bishop and ruin his pawn structure on f6. And thinking of a plan like that, uh, will often bring ideas into your mind and you're going to find remarkable solutions and great moves. But you need to think in terms of plans. Uh, gaining space. Uh, one common idea in the Italian is to play bishop to c2 uh, and then to play b4, a4. So do I want to ga gain space on the queen side? Yes, I want to chase away the pieces. I want to have more space on the queen side. My plan is to play bishop to c2 and to play a4, a5. Okay, uh, that's as simple as that, and I actually might go for that. So let's say knight to e7, bishop to c2, knight to g6, b4, uh, bishop to a7, a4. What is your idea? You Perhaps you want to play d4 and then have uh, a possibility of creating a passed pawn on the queen side. So this is a thing you need to keep in mind in this position. So if your plan is to gain space on the queen side, think about it. Does it benefit you? If you think it benefits you, uh, find ways in, in which your opponent can prevent that and calculate. And you are then going to have the plan of gaining space on the queen side in mind with every single move you make from this point on. Okay, uh, setting a trap. Uh, Okay, uh, let's say let's say your opponent plays. Uh, let's find the position. Okay, let's say your opponent plays bishop to a7 here. Uh, you continue with h3, one of the most common moves, and your opponent here plays knight to h5, which is the third most common move move for black. Uh, you might want to play this move with black in order to set up a trap. Now, there's a trap that isn't really dangerous here, and it leads to a sort of equal position where white is slightly active, but I would never uh, want to get that position with white pieces because I lose a pawn. Now, if white is unaware of that, he might fall into the trap. So the move knight to h5 might be setting a trap. So you might think to yourself, bishop a7, okay, I might go for that plan with, with knight to h5. That sets up a trap. Now, if you don't know the trap, you're going to have to be a genius to, to think of it at this point, but that's why pattern recognition helps. Let's say your opponent does play h3, and now you set up a trap, knight to h5. If your opponent uh, does nothing, then your knight is great, it's controlling the f4 square, one of the key squares in the game, you might get your other knight to e7 to g6 to make sure both of them control the f4 square, but one trap that white could fall into, which has happened numerous times, and it's not losing for white or anything, it's just it just lets black equalize easily, is for white to take on e5, and it does seemingly win a pawn, uh, but, okay, as the position unfolds, knight takes e5, queen takes h5, knight takes d3, white has just lost his d3 pawn, and after bishop to c2, knight takes c1, rook a takes c1, white has lost the pawn, and, uh, white, I'm sorry, white hasn't lost the pawn, white has exchanged the pawn, but lost the bishop pair, so, this is one, uh, one example of how uh, a trap could be utilized easily, because now uh, you have a dangerous bishop on the a7 square, which doesn't have any counterpart, and you could argue that black has achieved something. So this uh, trap with knight to h5 is threatening to basically win the bishop pair, and if white takes, there's almost nothing he can do about it. So, okay, this would be one example of setting a trap. Uh, another example uh, uh, would be... Well, you can find examples in, in games uh, in uh, in the openings that you play, and it's uh, redundant to to think of uh, traps specifically in the openings that you don't play. I just wanted to show you an example. But learning uh, middle games, analyzing middle games, we often will often give you ideas which are going to come up in your head during the game, and you are going to start thinking of a plan to set a trap. This specific trap wins the bishop pair, but. Uh, this was just what I had in the example position. Uh, I missed uh, closing the position down, so let's get back to our starting position. 
the Italian is a great uh, position to uh, to use for that example as well. So here in this position, let's say uh, black plays knight to e7. Your idea might be to close off this bishop, and d4 is a very common move in the Italian, the reason why you play c3, and here you might play d4 immediately. Uh, black's uh, most common move instead of knight to e7 was bishop to a7. So now you can do that with the gain of tempo. Takes, takes, bishop a7. You have just sort of closed a piece uh, down. So this is a plan, not closing the entire position, but one single piece. And you can often find pieces which you can close, or ways in, in which you could close the position to your advantage. So if, for example, and I can't use that uh, with this position, but just let's think. Uh, and um, let's say you have opposite sides castling, you have a dangerous... Uh, well, okay, let's, let's just take another board. I'm going to show you that. Let's say you're playing... Uh, you're playing some sort of uh, Nidorf or something with opposite sides castling. Uh, and... Uh, Let's say here, 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 and now uh, as white you are planning uh, to play bishop to e3, queen to d2, and castle long. And you, you know that you are going to have opposite sides castling. And you know what your opponent's plan is in that, in that case, it's to play b5, b4, and just crush you. So now already here, uh, on move 5 in the very theoretical Nidorf, you need to start thinking of ways to close the position down. And often this plan, which has been heavily analyzed and its theory, involves moves such as king to b1, uh, reinforcing your knight on c3, which is often a place at which uh, black sacrifices in exchange. So analyzing Nidorf games will help you uh, no understand how to close down the position and slow down black here. On the other hand, uh, white's plans in the English attack in Yugoslav attack are f3, g4, h4, g5. So black needs to think of how to close the king side in this position. So this, this would be just uh, just one example. And uh, those plans which are used as examples are really uh, just some uh, examples which you could have during the game. I didn't want to go over too many. Uh, but there are numerous uh, ideas during a middle game and it's important to think of them. You, you you can't expect to just have the best move come up in your head like a miracle. Best moves will come to you if they are part of a good plan. And coming up with good, with good plans uh, is going to become easier with practice. And you can't really practice uh, creating plans during a middle game if you don't think about creating plans. So my advice would be look at every position as if it were uh, a blueprint for a building. Just think of ways to create the best building possible. Don't just think about putting one window up on, or putting the door or whatever, painting the house. That doesn't work. If you, if you build a house like that, it would collapse. You need to start before you build a house. You need to think of it as you build it all the way up and you need to have your plan in mind during the entire process. If you took away architects blueprints during construction or whatever, I'm, perhaps I'm using the wrong metaphor, uh, he probably wouldn't know what to do. He would have to recreate them. So you need to have your plan in mind during the game okay i hope this uh, was clear i hope it wasn't boring or over overwhelming or too simple or too hard to understand uh, i tried to find a way to explain uh, how to create a strategy how to create middle game plans and i hope it helped let me know what you think please uh, i hope you enjoyed it and uh, stay tuned for more chess see you later bye bye